No, I'm not going insane, I promise you. I think this is a question that's definitely worth asking. Was Victor Orta a secret mastermind? Now, I know how this sounds, because he has a very, very, very bad record of some transfers at Leeds United. In this video, I'm going to run through, admittedly, quite a lot of the bad stuff, what he did well, and ultimately what I think he was good at and what it means going forwards. Well, not going forwards, he's gone, but what it means in terms of how we should reflect on him. First up, I'm going to look at the bad. And I'm going to do it by comparing last season's spending to this season and seeing how we replaced the various players that we signed last year that then pissed off quite promptly. First off, you got to look at Mark Rocker. Cost us 10 million quid and didn't do too much. He didn't run at all. His passing was pretty good and yeah, fine, it works. But his fitness was awful. He could barely do 60 minutes. By comparison, we got Glenn Kamara in. Half the price, does a hell of a lot of running, has an excellent touch on him. And is only just coming into his own, and he's already looking like one of our better players. Another player who was fairly ineffectual last season, and we replaced him for half the money-ish, Brendan Aronson. Now, I don't hugely agree with comparing these two as 10s, because Brendan Aronson's a right winger. Piri was a 10-9 hybrid kind of thing. But Brendan Aronson cost us about £25 million. That is an obscene amount of money for a player that had nine shots on target all season, I think I calculated it at slightly under £3 million per shot on target for an attacking midfielder is shocking. By comparison, Joel Piru we signed with an initial fee of around £10.5 million that would rise to 16 if we get promoted and if he hits various targets. Clear upgrade, no doubt. Next up, Adams to Ampadu. In terms of pure ability, I'd put these on about the same standing in terms of what we've seen on the pitch. They're both able to grab control of a match. They're both able to convey possession to the other midfielders that are a little bit more creative than them. They both do their job to a high standard. Issue is, Tyler Adams cost twice as much as Ethan Ampadu, £20 million compared to 10 and that's including the add-ons. And um, Adams was injured all the time, and Ampadu hasn't been yet. So, more football at the same standard for half the price? Easy win. Rasmus Christensen compared to Sam Byram. Doesn't even need asking, really, does it? Christensen is at Roma, doing absolutely nothing. Sam Byram was signed for free, compared to £10 million, and is still playing and can play probably anywhere across the back line. I'd trust him. Another one in terms of... I don't know whether his counts as free or not, or if it's like a fair comparison, but Lewis and Estera going for 25 Point four million pounds in, very expensive, and another player that was injured quite a lot for us. When he did play, he was quite good. I'm not going to doubt that, but he didn't very much compared to Jaden Anthony, who on loan and we don't need him that much compared to the other wingers that we've got. They play more football, but when Anthony has played, his looks at the very least a little bit below Lewis Sinistera. Not worth twenty five million pounds though. Next up, we've got to look at centre-back. We signed Max Vuba for 11 million quid. Rodon, we've got in on loan. And he looks a lot better than Max Vuba. We look a lot more secure and safe. And like we've got some leadership at the back. Although the £25 million permanent fee that's rumoured is massive. And I would rather that we keep the money sort of sensible with these players. I think it's worth it compared to £11 million for Vuba, who came in for six months, did nothing and then left. Another quick comparison, this one feels a little bit harsh, but Darko JB getting him in for £5 million was probably a bad move on reflection. I don't know whether there's much value there in comparison to Gray, who was already significantly better that was already here. It's a stretch to say that that was the right signing. Maybe we should have gotten Lavia instead. In addition to that, we have the worst of the lot. Weston McKenney, we signed on loan. But if we would have stayed up, we would have had to sign him for... Had to have signed him, there we go, for £30 million. Pounds. For a player that was built like the Michelin man and travelled significantly less than him. And then on the other side, we've got Ilya Gruev, who has probably done more running than Weston McKenney did all of last season. And I admit that what I've said so far makes it seem like Victor Orta made the stupidest decisions and last season he did. But I feel like if you're looking at his entire tenure, he wasn't a complete idiot and he had some highlights. Because he had a fairly impressive youth record. Now, there are a lot of youth players that he signed that didn't quite work out. And that's fair enough because I can't remember who said it, but it might have been Reavy or someone that said that you need a 50-50 rate of successful to unsuccessful transfers. And then you've done your job quite well. 
just going to run through some of the most successful uh, successful youth signings here. Ilan Melier for £5 million is one of the best signings that I will see at Leeds United. He is still a top-tier goalkeeper. He was lacking confidence for the last two years. Fair enough. Wasn't quite at it. But that save at Leicester shows that he's got a hell of a lot of potential. And he was fantastic in our first year in the Premier League. It's just when the structures around him started to collapse, he dealt with it badly because he is still incredibly young. I think Ilan Melier is a fantastic investment. We could easily get five times that now. And I think we were rumoured to have gotten a bid in for five times that, and we decided to keep him. Absolutely perfect. Good signing. Good start for Victor Orta. Next up, we've got a bunch of players that haven't necessarily kicked on yet at Leeds United, but are still good investments. Lewis Bate, Matteo Joseph, Joe Gelhart, Diogo Montero, and Cody Drame, all for a million pounds. Now, if you're seeing signing players as purely an exercise in this player will play for our first team, then sure, these haven't paid off. But Lewis Bate is still very promising in the under-21s. I'm surprised he's not come anywhere near a call-up to the senior squad yet. Matteo Joseph is still very, very young with a lot of developing to do. Joe Gelhart admittedly has stumbled a little bit recently, but he absolutely saved us in our second year in the Premier League. Diogo Montero is very, very young and captain to Portugal youth side. Getting that for a million pounds shows that he's got a lot of potential. And Cody Drame is an example of wasted potential at Leeds United. He's someone that has all the promise in the world and is definitely worth more than a million pounds, but not to us because he doesn't seem to perform when he's at Leeds. Slightly annoying, but those are all good investments on the face of it. The same applies for Sean McGurk, who is currently in the under-21s, ripping up the under-21s Premier Division. If we wanted to sell him, we could easily get half a million or so. That's another profit. But this is where I think the issue with Victor Orta not being able to sell players really starts to kick in. Another example, Leif Davis. We signed him initially for £50,000. and He's currently one of the best left-backs in League One. We could have gotten so much profit out of him if he would have developed properly at Leeds under Bielsa, under Marsh. But that didn't get to happen because reasons. And because he didn't develop well, we didn't sell him for that much. But then again, you've also got to think it's still a profit. And although, yeah, he didn't play very well at Leeds United, £50,000 is shit all. It's a week of wages for some players. Maybe not Leeds at the moment because we've had to deal with relegation clauses, stuff like that. But for the likes of Rodrigo, who was rumoured to be on £100,000 a week, half of half of a week of Rodrigo wages for Leif Davis, definitely worth it. Add to that Elia Capriel. You might have forgotten about Capriel because he was a sort of backup goalkeeper for a while, but he moved to Bari in, I think, Serie B and was proven to be one of the best goalkeepers in Italy at the time. And that is in Italy as a whole, including Serie A. He was so good over there to the extent that football manager considers him to be one of the most promising goalkeepers in the world. We signed him for £100,000. The fact that he didn't develop that much, maybe because he had to deal with like Melier developing next to him, is a problem, and the fact that our goalkeeping coaching wasn't fantastic for the past few years. We have to admit that, because we've now got another goalkeeping coach in, and Melier has looked a lot better. I think it's just a case of bad timing for Elia Capriel, but as the signing goes, it's been brilliant. Another case of that is Jan Paveda. Paveda, I remember, distinctly tore up Benjamin Mendy in the Premier League, which isn't something that you do easily, and we got him for free from Manchester City. An excellent signing. He just hasn't come on very well. But then again, if we were to sell him, we'd probably profit. Another player that we'd probably profit from would be Willy Nonto. We managed to sign an Italy international for £4 million and still be in a position after we got relegated where we can say, no, we're not going to take your bids because we feel like we can get more money out of him. Nonto is, although he's been a little bit disappointing in the championship this season, he has such a high ceiling that it makes him a fantastic investment because we can sell him for a profit in the future no matter what. I don't see his value dropping before below £4 million, just no matter what. There's money there. Next up is Sam Greenwood, who is another one where I feel like transitions between managers messed him about a little bit. Bielsa to Marshall, I moved to a, a midfield role where he seemed a little bit confused and didn't quite play perfectly. But he played really well in that Brentford match where we stayed up, which arguably worth the £1.5 million in and of itself. And we hit the Vic Drota issue again of being really bad at selling players. Thus, he's got an optional clause with Middlesbrough for £1.5 million at the end of the season. 
it's not a loss. We've just paid his wages for this period, but I think that's telling of Orta's ability to get in strong youth players that have a lot of promise to them, but not offload footballers very, very well. For example, Calvin Phillips for 40 million quid. Although it looks like we've absolutely rinsed Man City at the moment, he's arguably worth a little bit more than that, or at least when we sold him, he was. Then we've got the crowns, the crowns, the jewels in the crown of Victor Orta's youth recruitment. Crescencio Somerville only gets 1.3 million quid. Insane, insane bargain. At the moment, if we were to sell him, we'd look for 30. At the very least. Maybe even higher. And he's tearing up the championship with very few people competing for, with him for, like, creativity and the sheer, like, fun he brings to the pitch. Ruter is arguably the person he's, like, opposed with the most. And Ruter cost £35 million. Another player that we got from the Netherlands, really, really cheap, is Pascal Strauch. He was free. He didn't cost us anything from Ajax. And now he's captaining matches and part of the best centre-back pairing in the division alongside Joe Rodon. Orta's recruitment wasn't fantastic when he had a big budget to play with, but when he was sort of limited and had to look for those affordable deals, he did really well. Got to move the mic back. I don't know if you heard that, but that was a really bad time for the door to go. In terms of signing players on tight budgets, he could do that really well outside of the Wonder Kids as well. He found lots of older players on relatively tight budgets. I'm using relative here as a very, very relative term because tight budgets are hard to define when you're looking at a football landscape where the amount you spend is constantly evolving. For example, I think relatively signing Patrick Bam for £7 million is a really, really good investment. 19 Premier League goals shitloads in the championship and a like fundamental part of the way we played under Marcelo Bielsa. Relative bargain. Straight up bargains, however, were easy to find. Yanni Alioski played for us for, I think, two seasons under, well, three seasons. Two under Bielsa uh, in the championship, one in the Premier League, and he also played a little bit before that off the top of my head. But Two and two point two five million pounds for someone that was a starting Premier League left back and did really really well in that role is great work with a tight budget. Similarly, Mateus clicked for one point three million pounds when he came in. We all thought he might not be the best. He might be a player that goes out immediately on loan, and then he played ninety plus games in a row under Marcelo Bielsa, which really sort of proved how fundamental he was to that side. He was effectively a metronome. I think Phil Hay said. If you watch the game or watch the ball, you won't see Mateus Klitsch. But if you watch Mateus Klitsch, you'll see the whole match. In terms of relative budget work as well, I think Rafinha is still one of the best bits of recruitment I've seen in the Premier League in a long time. £17 million for a player that we then sold two years later for 60 kept us up and gave us an incredible season of Premier League football and is now a Brazil international. In fact, he was able to spot him make the side that he bought them from, I think it was Ren again, uh, sell him for a loss because they signed him for 20 million quid, then sold him for 17 million the next season. Great work. So what went wrong? We know that there's a hell of a lot of stuff that Vic Drota did right, but at the end of the day, things went bad for a reason. I think the first reason that things went bad is the way that he transitioned from head coach to head coach. He went from Bielsa, who was a constant high-pressing counter-attacking side that used the entire pitch to Jesse Marsh, who still pressed a hell of a lot, but in really tight, confined spaces, to Javi Gracia, who played a completely different style. And it meant that players effectively got like a tactical whiplash and forgot how to play football. Add to that the fact that there were increasing budgets because of Premier League football, and of course, Victor Otter working better within those tight budgets that he had to really think through a problem with. And the fact that at one point we needed to sign a lot more experience in terms of players, like we ended up signing off the top of my head, like we didn't sign experienced, experienced players. We ended up with the likes of Vuber and McKenney and Tyler Adams, who were all still really young, but technically experienced. So that didn't quite work out either, because as we've seen, he's an expert in finding those youth players. So ultimately, was Victor Otter a secret mastermind? No. At the end of the day, I think he was effectively a head of youth development that is best served working with an under-21 squad's budget that got over-promoted into a position of being a director of football. And it worked for a while. We signed Marcelo Bielsa. 
we got up through the signings that Victor Auto made, but then we collapsed back down again due to signings that Victor Auto made. Hope you enjoyed the video. I know this is a fairly comprehensive topic that people like to talk about, so pop in the comments below what you think. Uh, like if you enjoyed, subscribe, and even become a channel member. It's hugely appreciated if you can. I will see you next time.